And let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. We're going to use verses 6 through 8 as our reading this morning. So chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. If you have it, say amen. Amen. Let's read. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all of them also that love is in the period. Amen. Now this morning, you know, believe it or not, I'm sure most of you can say, I believe it at the pace we've been going, that this is actually our 36th message in the book of 2 Timothy. And you know, and as we're wrapping up here, we've been looking at this, you know, the information that Paul has been giving to the body of Christ, you know, on dealing with what's going to be happening to the body of Christ as we start approaching kind of the last days of this dispensation. And last week we really kind of focused on verses 6 and 7 where Paul saw his time is being short. He could make this statement of, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And how all of that was making a reference to the plan of the ministry that had been given unto him. And we, look, we tied that into the issues of the soldier, the athlete, and the husbandman that he brought up in, ch in chapter number two. So that's kind of a quick summary of what we did last week. And I'm bringing it up because in verse 8, Paul uses it, he starts off with the word, henceforth. You know, meaning that because of what has been said, what has gone on, this is going to be the result of this. And so we're going to be talking about this whole issue when he says here, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So he's talking about this issue. There's a crown of righteousness. which is going to be given by the Lord. There's a time element that's there. That day. And it's going to be given to the Apostle Paul and to all that love <coughs> his appearing. So what I just wrote on the board really kind of almost gives the outline of what we're going to be looking at today. We're going to be kind of defining what this crown is. Actually, that's going to be the last part of the message. We're going to... We would say, well, why is being given by the Lord? We've talked about that time element, when that's going to occur, and why it goes to the Apostle Paul and also to all that love his appearing. So let's start with this issue of you know the Lord actually being the one who can give this righteous. You know, the crown of righteousness here. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. And 
here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, where we hear verses 20 and 21. It says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. <clears throat> Paul defined him as the righteous judge. The righteous judge is the one who knew no sin. The, the one that sin couldn't be found in him, the one that as in Galatians where it talks about that we've been redeemed from the law, the individual who took care of the law, took care of the sin issue, in a manner said when we have his righteousness. So that way when he looks at, when God looks at us, you know, he looks at Dave, or he looks at Jack, or he looks at Minister Rondell, or he looks at Jim. He doesn't see those names that I just read along. Hmm. He sees the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ in each and every one of those individuals. Everyone that has put their trust in the gospel already has that righteousness the moment they believe. And we, there's nothing to have, you know, no extra steps. You know, so it's not like, okay, you put your trust in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. That was step one. Mm -hmm. Now we got 36 more steps. <sighs> and they're all easy steps. And once you do all 36 of those, you're going to have righteousness. God says, you know, you can have righteousness in one easy step. Mm -hmm. Put your trust in that gospel. The righteous judge is the one who could be able to look and see and say, you know what, I can see that perfection there because... The righteousness of God is in you. That's why his sacrifice on the cross at Calvary means exactly what the word of God says. That means, let's go over to Romans chapter number 5. And here in Romans 5, we're going to start here in verse 15. It says, not, But not as the offense, so also is to forgive. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God, the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by, one, by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, this passage here is here. A couple of things that you know, kind of throw people off, and one is that they go where it says, "But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound." And they go, "Well, see, 
I am, you know, look at all the sin that I, I keep doing. It allows grace to much more abound in me. Well, when Paul's talking about sin in this passage, what's the definition of sin that he's using here in Romans chapter number 5? The transgression of the law. Is it possible today for a believer to commit the sin that's being talked about here in Romans chapter number 5? No. no. Because if it was possible, it would mean that something could still be put to your account, which would mean that what happened here wasn't good enough. Now, you think about that statement. That the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't good enough to take care of the sin issue. Mm. How arrogant does somebody have to be to really say that what the Lord Jesus Christ accomplished only took care of part of the problem? The one who did not commit sin took care of the sin issue. Amen. That's what Paul's making a reference to here when he's talking about the whole issue of that, you know, for example, in verse 18, therefore is by the offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. Now, I use that verse for a particular reason in there because individuals take this to say, well, see, you know, there's going to be a time when all individuals, since it uses that word all, and all means all men, that there will be a time where all mankind is going to be, as it says, you know, that the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. That there will be a point where all of mankind is going to receive justification of life. The issue that comes up, and Paul brings it up in 1 Corinthians 15, is the issue of the identification that an individual has. When we're born, we're identified in who? Right. Well, when, we're, when we're born, we're identified in the Adam. We're identified in the first Adam. When we put our trust in the Gospel, we're identified in Christ, the last Adam. Our identification is where either we're going to be in that point of where there's condemnation, if we're still identified in Adam, the only thing that could happen is condemnation unto that individual for identified in Christ. The only thing that can happen is the fact that we're going to rule and reign with him in heavenly places for all of eternity. There's not a, there's really what someone sees in this, it's almost a second chance for somebody. You know what I mean? Individual, and I'm not going to, you know, use someone here because I want to uh, think of say that someone here is not saved. But say that there was somebody sitting in this chair right here that, that wasn't saved, and we present the gospel to them over and over and over again, and they don't accept it. That, well, you know, they they had the opportunity, they didn't accept it, and you know, there's a future point in time where God's going to kind of go, hey, you know what? By it. You know, even though you didn't accept, I'm still bringing you in. The scriptures don't teach that. The scriptures teach that the individual who had rejected the gospel, their name's not found in the book of life. And those who are not found in the book of life are going to be cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. The gospel message, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Mm. 
here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you read here verse 18 where it says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. What happened here, it's not foolishness. It's the power of God because it took care of sin, death, the law, and has given to us the gift of eternal life because we've accepted what he did for us on that cross. And because of what he did, it can only be him that can be the one that's going to give this crown. Amen. Okay, well, before we get into the, the issue of the day, I want to go over to Philippians chapter 2 because we're going to come back to this passage. Thinking, if, I don't, if I don't bring it up now, I'm going to have to bring it up then, so I'm going to bring it up now. Philippians 2. We're going to start at verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what you see is that his name is exalted above everything else. And in his name, every knee will bow. And everyone's going to confess who he is. Now, we're going to come back to that. <sighs> well, I want to focus on right now is the issue of he is exalted. It can only be him that at that day is going to give everyone this crown. Now, let's start talking about that day, which is made a reference to and in the passage he clearly identifies when he says unto also unto all them also that love his appearing. So he's already tying this issue of that day into the idea of his appearing. Let's go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4. We're going to start here, verse number 13. It says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no home. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And the comfort comes from the fact that we know that whether we're alive or whether we're dead, that we're going to be with him in glory. And there's nothing that can prevent that from happening. The comfort comes from the fact that we know there's life after what happens here on planet Earth. Mm. Because 
if this is all that there was, how miserable would it be when you really think about what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis on planet Earth? If this is all that there was, how miserable would it be? And, and that's why Paul brings it up in 1 Corinthians 15 when he talks about those who deny the resurrection, that they're of all men most miserable. Because to them, this is it. But we know that you know, even when things are bad, that this is such a temporary situation. It's a short time compared with all of eternity to be with Him and reigning with Him. This is a comfort. That's why even when a member of the body of Christ, when they do die, you know, this is the comfort that people say, you know what? We're going to see them again. We are going to see every member of the body of Christ in heavenly places for all of eternity. And how comforting. You know, so in some ways where when we have, like for example, a memorial service, what we're mourning is we no longer have that physical relationship with the person. But we know that They're already with him in heavenly places. Amen. And we're going to be, we're going to see them again. That's where the comfort comes from. And we know that that day is approaching. We know that that's the hope that we have. And the promise has been given to us. And in fact, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. First Corinthians chapter number one, verse eight says, "Who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ." And he's again talking about that day, and how can we be blameless? It's not because of anything that we've done. We're blameless because he sees. Christ in us. That's how we can be blameless. The fact that we have that seal of the Holy Spirit which keeps us in that state. And that's an important thing to always kind of, you know, that we know when, when we start talking with individuals, we need to let them know that you know, there is a Sealing ministry that goes on. It's not that thing of where, you know, okay, I'm saved. He, you know, I'm saved back here, but I did something and lost my salvation, and now I need to be saved again. And and you hear individuals talk about that, and they'll sometimes talk about how they've had to be saved three or four times because they keep losing their salvation. And it's sad when you really think because to them they don't have their hope. They're struggling with this thing of, well, you know, I can keep losing my salvation. If I don't have my salvation, what happens to me if I die? If I die today while I'm waiting to become saved again? <laughs> you know, rather than having they have confidence to know that I'm saved, I'm kept that way, and I can be looked at as being blameless when he comes back. There's nothing that's going to be on my account to say, you know what, Scott, you weren't good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, 99% of you was good, but there's just one little thing that's on your account. And so, you know, sorry, you're, 
you're not going to get into heaven. No. We're blameless. Let's go to Philippians chapter number one. Philippians chapter number one. The reader of verse six says, Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. There's a good work that's being performed in us that's going to be until the day of, you know, I'm going to use the word, the day of Jesus Christ when he comes back for the church. Verse 10, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And it all keeps coming back to this day that we're waiting for. The day when he comes back for the church and we receive this crown that he's talking about. Now Paul says that it's going to be given to him and to all them that love his appearing. Now, the Apostle Paul, let's go over to Acts chapter number 9. Acts chapter number 9, you have the beginning part of the chapter, you have him seeing the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him from heavenly places. I want to pick up here starting in verse 10, because I want to focus on a different part of the chapter here where it says, And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and Choir in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayed. And hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And God refers to Paul as being a chosen vessel. He's chosen for a purpose which is to function as the apostle of the Gentiles. The function as the pattern that he talks about in 1 Timothy chapter number 1. Now the pattern is not you know, the beginning part of Acts chapter number 9. The pattern is, here's the information that's being given to you, and here's the pattern for you and how to live your life. That's why he could sign, let's go over to Colossians chapter number 1. Because this is really where that pattern comes from, is what he says here. And here in Colossians chapter number 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. And the word fulfill means to bring to completion. Paul, his message brought to completion the word of God. And 
mainly because I don't want to, because if I do it on here, I'll, I'll, work, I'll knock the, the, the thing down again. So, mm. this is how everything else, and you take Paul's epistles out of there, it all lays out according to one thing. I'll kind of hold it still for a second as I'm talking here. When it's brought to completion, you have the whole program that's put in here that deals with where all of this all deals with God's earthly promise. You have the, the restoration of the earth, its reconciliation back unto him. Paul talks about the reconciliation of the heavenly places. That completes God's program. It's given to Paul to do that. So when Paul pens his last epistle, which is the one we've been studying, the word of God is complete. We have, you know, so there's no lost books in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Even though you can go to a bookstore today and find a book that's entitled The Lost Books of the Bible. You know, there's no books that are lost. You know, we have a completed word of God. You know, Paul received his message directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. He was given the information to be able to share with everyone. That's why he can say, be followers of me as I am of Christ. He followed the Lord Jesus Christ according to the doctrine that was being given to him. We're to do the same thing. We see him draw that distinction. Let's go over to Romans 15. And those who were here during the Sunday school heard, heard me say we were gonna <coughs> that we were gonna talk about just <coughs> and here we are talking about them. Where there's that distinction that is brought up here in Romans 15, where in verse 16 he talks about him, himself and his ministry here when he says that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. He talks about his ministry to the Gentiles and everything that's been given to him. If we go up a few verses in the chapter, we go to verse 8, where it says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Back here, there's a whole bunch of promises that are being made to the nation of Israel. When the Lord Jesus Christ comes, here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's to confirm those things. That's why he can say things of salvation is of the Jews. When he sends out the apostles, he tells them, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And, and basically he kind of yells at them about, you know, you know, don't go to these people, don't go to these people, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this message is for Israel. We talked about during Sunday school how you know, a Gentile could receive salvation, but the only way they did is they had to become part of Israel, in God's eyes, they were no longer a Gentile. They were a Jew. And that's where you get the issue of them. I'm just going to abbreviate there. There's that middle wall of partition that separates the two out. 
The only way a gent, you know, so if a Gentile believed that gospel, they were no longer down here because they were without Christ, strangers from the covers of promise, having no hope. They were up here. Well, praise be the, you know, God of what happens during this dispensation. There's no middle wall partition there. It's Jew and Gentile making up the body of Christ. That message has been given to him. So that's why this crown can go to him. But then there's this group that's called all that love his appearing. Now, the individuals that are going to love his appearing, when he comes back for the church, are those that have put their trust in the fact that Christ died for sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And they put their trust in that, and that alone, for their salvation, those are the individuals that are going to love his appearing. Because that's the group of people he's coming back for. And he's pulling that group out because, as he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the body of Christ is not appointed to wrath. When his appearing is coming, the next thing that's happening is the restoration of Israel's program, which means the wrath of God being poured out because of the unbelief that had occurred related to the nation of Israel. So, the body of Christ is going to love that appearing because it means that we're being pulled away before that wrath is going to happen. You know, let's go over to, I think we're still in Romans, let's go to Romans chapter 4. And I just want to read this passage here because, you know, people want to start trying to tie works in here, but let's do Romans 4. Sorry, verse 1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And bring this up because, you know, so many times you hear people want to go back to the, you know, thing, you know, James writes, faith without works is dead. And you go, what? You see, you have to do something as a demonstration of your faith. Well, what's Paul saying? Him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. Because a person's trying to earn their salvation. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, or put their trust in the gospel. And here's the key within, in where so many people struggle. His faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. And the whole issue is because it's not our faith that's counted. It's His, the Lord Jesus Christ's faith that's counted for righteousness. Because He was faithful in what He did. He was faithful in performing everything so that the sacrifice could be a perfect sacrifice so it could take care of the issue of sin 
the law, death, and to give us what he identifies at the end of 1 Corinthians 15 when he says that we have the victory. The battle is already won for us. Mm. And we're not, that's why you see all the things when he says that you know, we already have forgiveness. Because the battle's already won. Right. Mm. Israel, they're waiting for their forgiveness because the battle hasn't been finished for them yet. By having a victory, Paul can say, we already have forgiveness. That's why our motivation to forgive someone is the fact that, well, we're already forgiven. We've had that demonstration of love that's been given to us. So we should reflect that out and forgive somebody else. You go back to here, and there are issues. Well, you know what? This person did, did me wrong. And, you know, I really don't want to forgive them. But if I don't, God's not going to forgive me. And their forgiveness becomes conditional on them forgiving other people. Because they still don't have their forgiveness yet. They still have to work for it. We already have that forgiveness. So we're going to love his opinion. Even if we're that group of individuals that in 1 Corinthians 3 that it talks about when we're standing before the judgment seat of Christ and you know the fire comes down and everything's burned away. Mm. You know, the wood, hay, and stubble burn away and you look and there's no gold, silver, or precious stones there. Mm. It says, you're saved, yet so is by fire. We still love his appearing because we're still saved. Now, I said we we're going to go back to the thought process in Philippians where it talks about that every knee shall bow because it says, well, you know, well, everyone loves his appearing because, see, every knee is going to bow. Everyone's going to identify him as the Lord. So, everybody loves his appearing. Well, just because everyone can identify him that way and everyone's going to bow that way doesn't mean that everyone's going to have a salvation and receiving rewards from that because the unclean spirits, the, the devils, knew exactly who he was. Let's go over to Mark chapter number 1. <clears throat> Mark chapter number 1. And we'll start here at verse number 21. It says here, they went into Capernaum and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority, not as the scribes. And there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, and come out of him. Okay. Now, you think about it, think of how many people really could identify him as being the Holy One of God. You know, there weren't many that were walking around that were identifying him in that way. And yet this unclean spirit identifies exactly who 
who he is. And every time you see that he has these encounters with them, they're identifying him. In fact, one of them, they even say, are you come to destroy us before the time? Look, they already, they know this time frame, and they're going, well, you're coming, you're coming back before the time's even is supposed to happen? Wait, what's going on here? They know who he is. In fact, let's go over to James chapter number 2. James 2, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, and thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. You know, they're not you know, jumping around and yelling, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. He's here. They're trembling in fear. When they're bowing at that point, you know, some of them, it's not going to be the thing of, <coughs> you know, praise the Lord, he's here, I'm bowing to worship him. It's the judge is here and in fear and trembling, that bowing occurs. In fear and trembling, they're identifying who he is because they know that the judgment is there for them. It's not a happiness. That, it's not a loving is appearing. It's a, oh no, he's here. <laughs> we have no more time. The judgment has come for us. We love his appearing because we know how oh, that means that if he's coming back for us, it means we're going up to the heavenly places to, reign, to rule and reign with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, that's something that we all look forward to as our home. So when we look at the issue, we, like so we've, thinking now we've got to circle back to identify what it is that this crown actually is for us. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians 15. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, let's start here at verse number 51. It says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. But this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I went that far down just so we could see that we do have that victory. But at the beginning of this passage, we see that Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, when we talk about you know, the whole you know, dispensation of the grace of God, you know, one of the terms that we use, and you know, we're back here is prophecy, and here is mystery. Inside of the mystery is that you know, you'll see Paul use this thing of, you know, 
It'll talk about how I show you a mystery. And as he's doing it, he's teaching them something new that they hadn't received before. Amen. Now, when we, if you look at how the epistles have been laid out, you know, one of the things that they already would have known about, they would have already known about his appearing. The mystery is what, how he finishes the verse. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. The mystery is the fact that we're going to be given a resurrection body that's going to be able to exist in heavenly places for all of eternity that's incorruptible. Now, those who are putting a judgment that's out here, and I'm not going to draw on the, on the wall because I, I don't think they'd be too happy if I drew on the wall. <laughs> but out here, there's the lake of fire. There's a body that the people who are cast into the lake of fire are going to receive that's going to allow them to exist in the lake of fire for all of eternity. <clears throat> because if you think about you know, the body we have now, if you threw it in the lake of fire, it would just instantly burn up and dissolve. And so it would really just be a, a destruction or an annihilation of that individual. The judgment is that a person is going to actually exist in that eternal separation from God, in a state where their body is going to be there and be able to suffer and go through all those things without the presence of God. Well, we're given a body that's going to be reflective of the glory of God to be able to exist in heavenly places. You know, this is why when you look at things, let's go to Titus chapter number 2. And we go here for you know, the one main purpose, and I want to focus on something else from this passage, this time here in Titus 2. But we start at verse 11, where it says, For... The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And while I focus this on what he's saying in verse 13, because he draws a distinction between the issue of our hope and his appearing. We have a hope based on everything that the scriptures identify. We know that we're going to receive it all at his appearing. But we understand the hope that we're going to have. We understand we're going to get this body that's going to allow us to be able to function as God intends for us to function in the heavenly places that crown of righteousness that not only is Paul going to receive, but everyone that loves his appearing is going to receive this crown of righteousness. And having said that, we'll open up the floor for questions and comments. Go ahead, G.